Lord Jesus, we, um, we're in awe of your word. Your word continually exceeds expectations, God. No matter how many times we read the same thing over and over again, there's new light. There's food. Your word says that you are the, the showbread, hmm. the bread of life, the hidden manna, the manna which came down from heaven. And now we like chirping little birds just opening our mouth waiting to be filled, standing on the promise that your word says that if my people will open their mouths wide, I'll fill them. Fill us up, God. The knowledge of the plan that you have for us. May nothing interfere with that ever again. In the name and power of the blood of the most awesome king, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me tell you about Israel. Israel was a nation forged out of one man. There was a man named Abraham. You could read about him. There's a book in the Bible called Genesis. If you read that book, you'll see this man named Abram. And later on, God breathes life into him and changes his name to Abraham. And from him, he's called out from where he lives to get out to a place God will show him. And he went out, and he did that. God showed him many great things, you can see through the book of Genesis. I mean, he had a son named Isaac when his wife was 90 years old. <laughs> and Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Don't remember their names all, so I'm not going to make believe I do. One's named Dan, how's that? Another one's named Judah. And from Judah, the Savior comes. But before that happens, Jacob has 12 sons, and those sons give birth to God's chosen nation called Israel. And one of Jacob's sons is also named Joseph. Joseph is the favorite son. And his brothers are jealous of that because he's the baby of the family and he does this a lot. He chat, chat, chat. So they do what any 11 brothers would do. They throw him in a ditch and leave him for dead. Happens all the time. Well, he gets saved by some passerbys. He gets sold into slavery. And through the amazing providence of God, Please keep in mind, I am leaving so much out, but I've got to get to the Bible study. He winds up the second in command in all of Egypt. And there's a famine in the land, and all the nation of Israel moves to Egypt. Well, that was a mistake, because they wind up being slaves, real slaves, not like not like biblical, be set free in seven years slaves. These are, these are a beaten people. And they start to cry out to God. So God rescues them. And he brings them across the desert and shows them this land called the promised land. But instead of taking a week to get there, it takes them 40 years. Because just like some other people we know, every time God blesses them, they turn their back on God. It's the craziest thing. I don't know if you're like this, but there's, I, see, I notice there's two kinds of Christians. When things go bad in your life, you turn to God or you run from God. When things go good in your life, you either turn to God or you run from God. It's kind of a crazy thing. Well, the Jewish nation, whenever things went bad with them, they turned to God. Whenever things got good for them, they turned their back on God. So God raises up a king called Nebuchadnezzar from a nation of Babylon. And they take the Israelites captive again. Now, I want you to know, in 1948, the nation of Israel became a nation again. 
after 2,000 years of not having a homeland. No nation has ever become, after less than 200 years, they cease to exist. The Girgashites, the Hivites, the, the I could go oh, through nation of nation of people. When they lost their homeland, they never became a nation again. But God's word promised they would. However, digressing, after 70 years of being slaves in Babylon, God's righteous hand reached out and set them free. And he did it. You got to read the book of Nehemiah to find out how he did it, because it's so cool. Nehemiah and Ezra tell the tale. I want you to think about something for a second. 1929 or 30, I think it was, maybe even 31. France got overtaken by Nazis. And they went into they went into the cities and they just told the people, "You're out. Get out. Get out of your house. It's not your house anymore." Jews over there, non-Jews over there. And they said, just Jews, killed them. This is less than 100 years ago, guys. Imagine, if you will, somebody shows up at your house and says, excuse me, would you please come outside in the street? Think about where you live, having lines of people on the streets. And then these guys with guns and tanks and everything that they need, that they out, um, out muscle you, so to speak, because they out arm you. And they just say, okay, you're a Jew. Oh, you were hiding somebody under your bed? Boom, you're dead too. Crazy. I just want you to think about that for a second. And then. How many of you guys have not seen Schindler's List? Everybody here seen Schindler's List? I hope so. You've got to watch that movie. And then all of a sudden, one day, after the Jews are in internment camps, they're set free. Go home. Now, I tell you that whole story because Psalm 126 would fall short if you didn't have something in your heart that just pulled at it. I want you to think, what's the name of that movie? Um, something Broken. It was a war movie? Unbroken. Huh? Unbroken. It was the guy that runs, right? Movie called Unbroken. You got to see that too. That was about World War II, though, right? where the Japanese got all people from all these different countries. If you were on the wrong side of the war, and they kept them in these uh, concentration camps, these internment camps, and how they were treated. And then all of a sudden, one day, war's over. Japanese people literally just walked away. And all these people are like, we can leave now? Yeah. Well, how are we supposed to get home? Well, we're hoping that they're going to send a ship in a few days. And I mean, it depicts it so beautifully. And again, I'm painting this picture so Psalm 126 has the impact. Because let me, for a second, transpose Psalm 126. Application, Christian, I don't know where you were when you got saved. I don't know where your life was about, assuming here you're saved. But I know where my life was. And I felt so much like that. The first day I accepted Christ as my savior, the weight that was off my shoulders, it was just, I mean, I was like walking around like this to like, now what do I do? Every day was a journey on this. I remember it. Anybody amen that? Verse 1 of Psalm 126. 
When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. I want you to picture the Israelites being set free. I want you to picture the Americans or the, or the, um, the English or, or whoever was on our side back, back then, whoever was the uh, allied. Imagine getting set free. It's over? You mean I, I lived? I made it? You mean... I don't have to go back to that life anymore? You mean I'm, I don't have to? I remember being a young man, going to Catholic church every Christmas, whether I needed it or not, and sitting in the church, looking at that guy on the cross, knowing he was mad at me, and looking at the stations of pain all around the walls, and the holy hush of a Catholic church, there's nothing like it. It's the one thing I really dig about it. Shh. Hear everything. I remember looking up at that thing a dozen times and going, I wish I can give you something, but there's nothing good in me. I'm gone. I've crossed the line. I'm too far away. I wish I could. I wish I, wish I wasn't born in this, in this city. I wish I wasn't born in this neighborhood. I wish I hadn't been born in this family. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. Anybody? But that was a lie of the enemy, guys. That was a lie of the devil. God said, come to me. I'll take care of you. No way. Too far. I've crossed the line. I've gone too far. I remember I got saved and I was like, I smiled. I didn't smile. My neighborhood, you don't smile in my neighborhood. Not outside, anyway. We literally practice our evil looks in the mirror. We literally sit in the mirror like, Why? What? And you got to remember, I grew up and I'm Italian, so if you've ever seen um, Taxi Driver, it's required watching for Italians. I don't suggest you watch it. But there's a scene where Robert De Niro, he's looking in the mirror. Are you talking to me? You must be talking to me because I don't see it. Like every one of us. Didn't matter. And we're, did you, you do that? Yeah. You admit it once in a while, man. What happened to that guy? Ugh. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. And our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Guys, I don't know what curse is on your life, but let me tell you about the curse on my life. Parents, drug addicts, among other things. Brother dead at 45, two other brothers dead as babies. Um, family of people who have died young, of people who have been arrested. Uh, it's the curse on my family, the long list that stands pushing me, I could only, if I had a Facebook page, and there was a picture of me and my wife, together 33 years, faithful, in love, seven grandkids, the people in my neighborhood look and go, no freaking way. Not him. No way. If I, if I was going to have a Facebook page, I would do it just so I could say, Please, guys, look what God can do. Look. You give God a hand. There ain't nothing wrong with that there. If you're here and you think 
you're far gone or beyond rescue or relationship too far. Or you Listen, there is no such place. I will quote the movie, Scarface. Every day above ground is a good day in Christ. I added the in Christ, just in case you didn't know. You gotta dig this song. The people have been set free. They're walking out of Babylon. When the Lord brought back the captive ones from Zion, we were like those who dream. They said, among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. I mean, think about that. And that's how our walk is supposed to be in Christ. Man, it ain't, guys, it ain't supposed to be like this. It ain't. And if you do this thing the right way, man, it's like this. And though the outward be perishing, the inward should be being renewed day by day by day. You're getting older, but you're getting better. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. When our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Hey, guys, verse 5 and 6 is an encouragement. It's kind of strange, and I might be putting an inflection on this, but it's like the people that are walking out of every place and time, they look back for a second at whoever's back, and they listen. God answers prayers, man. I want you to know God answers prayers. you got to know that. You gotta believe it. Every prayer for your son, every prayer for your daughter, every prayer for your marriage, every prayer is never a waste. Listen to what the guy that wrote this, who had been set free from captivity, said. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. In case you don't know what sowing is, guys, because maybe there's some people that don't know, understand agriculture. So if you have a field, or let's say you have a plant, a pot, a pot, you fill it with dirt, you take your hand and you make a hole in it, you take the seed and you sow it. You're sowing it, you're putting it in. Now, in agricultural times, they used to have these fields, and they used to have a guy that rode the... Um, the oxen that had the, it's like a cleaver looking thing called a wedge or plow. And they plow the field and as they cut the, 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 the dirt in, a, in a, a, a row, there'd be the sower in back of it. They'd sow the seed in it. They'd sow the seed in it. They that sow in tears shall reap Enjoy. Do you not know what reaping is? I just reaped. You heard the saying? What you reap, you've sown. You plant the seed of hate, you raise a flower of fire. What you reap, you sow. And if you sow in tears, you will reap in joy. If you pray without ceasing, if you pray believing, listen. On the face of this planet, there is one continent that has enslaved people more than any other. That's Africa. They enslave each other, enslave each other, and sell each other for nothing. I can't imagine being a part of generations and generations and generations of slavery, not thinking there could be more. And then they exported it to other countries, Spain, 
was the worst in history. And then they brought it here to this new country founded on the principles of God. And the people must have got here. The slaves must have got here. He said, man, we heard about America, but there's nothing new. This is just like being an Ivory. Ain't nothing new here. But people prayed. They prayed. And after generations and generations, one man stood up and he said, emancipate these people. You know they're going to cause a civil war. Who cares? Let it come. If you've never seen the movie Amistad, shame on you. Amistad is one of the greatest movies ever made. And it shows the freeing of the slaves and the treachery that they were placed under. But if, but if slaves can be set free through prayer, what, what are you worried about? God will show up. Prayer turns nations around. I've, I've talked about this, guys. I'm a fighter. I'm not a prayer. I'm a warrior. I'm not a person of prayer. I'm down with the whole war program. No problem. You want the country? Take it. Locked and loaded, baby. Got an armory full of them, too. Don't worry. Come get it. Tell that guy on TV. We're going to go, we're going to make their guns legal. Will you come get them? I almost, I, I, there's no words to, to put this, how much consternation in my spirit there is that I have to turn the other cheek. I've got to let them come. And I just got to be a person of prayer. If I'm going to change this country, it will not be by means of force. You know why? The Bible says that he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. He who leads into captivity will be led into captivity. And then, the words of the Lord Jesus, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. <sighs> Can I go to war? No. It's not what you've been called for. Oh. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Five and six should be like the ultimate memory verse for every frustrated human being. Everyone, myself included. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who goes forth bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. Bearing his sheaves with him. No question. I'm burned in my memory. I say it over and over again. God, you promised. But I've been praying for this kid. God, you promised. But you, I've been praying. God, you promised. God, you promised. God, you promised. God, always end with God, you promised. He who bears seed for sowing. Again. He who goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall, what's that word? doubtless come again with rejoicing. That word for rejoicing there literally means screams of joy. Shouts of joy. Bringing his sheaves with him. You know what sheaves are? Sheaves are what they used to take the... Um, when you reap a harvest of wheat, they take the top of the, the head off and they throw it in a, like a blanket. And then you fold the blanket over, you tie it up, and you throw it over your shoulder. Guess what that is? That's your sheave. It promises you. When you pray, cry out to God. 
water your prayer with tears. It's all a crazy thing. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a little glimpse into the difference between prayer and prayer. There's prayer. Um, who wants to say grace? Thanks for the food. Let's go. And then there's, there's an amazing book called Prevailing Prince of Prayer. There was a man in upstate New York in the 1940s. They had something in New York in the 1940s, upstate New York, called the Great Revival. And it was led by a preacher named Finney. But he never took credit. My, he, he used to say that my preaching meant nothing because there was a man whose name I forget, which is so apropos, who would go into the towns that he was preaching in two to three weeks in advance and pray. He'd walk the streets and pray. It says in this book that sometimes he'd get so intense in prayer, he'd get nosebleeds. Like, what am I missing? Battle. Amen. I sit in my chair, and, and I've got this chair. I, see, I've, got a, I've got a pain in my lower back. So I have to have a reclining chair, because otherwise it hurts. So I sit. Daniel Nash, prevailing prince of prayer, right? Oh. So I sit back in my chair, and I put my arms up, and I start to pray. But last week, it was like 55 degrees outside. So I got a blanket and I wrapped it around myself, like a shawl. I'm such a wimp. I am such a wimp. Guys, the guy got nosebleeds from praying. He who bears seed and waters them with tears shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bearing his sheaths with him. I don't know what's in your sheaf, but let me tell you what should be in your sheaf, married couple. Your marriage. Parents, your children. Your lost family members. Your nation. And you should be reaping and sowing and reaping and sowing I'm going to tell you something. You need to get a book about this big, one of those little uh, five by eight pads. And you need to write down on that thing a list of prayers and pray it. And then I want you to take that book and I want you to put it in a drawer and look at it in about 10 years. Because that's what I did. I used to have this little book that I wrote stuff down in. But you pray it so much, you just start to memorize it, right? So me and my wife have moved a few times in the last 20 years. And stuff just gets put in boxes and put, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden you go through the box one day and go, hey, one of my prayer pads, look at that. And I looked at it and I was just like, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I cannot believe how many of those prayers that I prayed, that I probably haven't prayed in 10 years, that God answered without me. And then the ones that he answered. And then some that I'm still praying that he hasn't answered yet. But I'm standing on verse 6, that he who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Prayer is the biggest make-believe thing there is. Let me tell you why. Any fool thinks he can pray. I talk to people all the time. I don't even know. I pray all the time. I think you mistake what prayer is. No, man, I, I, I pray all. I'm, I, I watch. Just because I'm not a Christian, you think I don't pray? Um, what do you think prayer is? Here's what I want you to do. The next, next week, on, on Wednesday night, we're going to have a prayer meeting. And we're going to be here, and we're going to pray for about an hour and a half. 
You guys show up. And let me see how many of you guys could stand in this circle and pray every single prayer that's given in for an hour and a half with fervor and with zeal. But it's so easy. Yeah, but, like, I keep getting updates. You know, people keep pinging me or something on, on Facebook, and I have to answer. Right. You mean you can't pray for an hour? No, it's not that. I could. It's just too easy. Do you know how many couples come to me and they say, hey, Pastor Ryan, we're having marriage problems. And I go, oh, can you, can you be our marriage counselor? And I say, I'm not a marriage counselor. And you go, oh, well, do you know one? Oh, uh, wait. I'm a biblical counselor, though. I can tell you what the Bible says about marriage. Is that the same thing? It's better. It's even better. So the couples come in and they say, well, he did this and she did that and he did this. And I go, okay. You guys pray together? No. You guys read the Bible together? No. Okay, here's what I want you to do. The next week, every night, I want you to pray together, just for five minutes. And I want you to read her a chapter from the Bible. Just, just one a day. Okay? And then come back and see me in a week. And if things haven't gotten better, you're a liar. I don't say that, but that's why I say in my head, just so you know. Nobody has ever come back to me, not once, in 25 years in ministry, and said, yes, we pray together and read the Bible together all the time, and we still can't get things... Not true. Not true. No, here's what people want. They want me to get a magic wand. Here's my magic wand. Here it is, and go, your husband's not a jerk anymore. Still a jerk? Can you take him to the jujitsu class? <laughs> Doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. You guys see verse 1? That should be the basis of every single thing you do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Unless the Lord builds the house. Well, we met on Christian Mingle. Well, I'm glad for that. Now, how do we continue from Christian Mingle? Do we pray together and read together? Now, before you bought that house and spent that money did you lift that up to the Lord? I told you, I pray all the time. Okay, well, give me the verse that God gave you. Well, uh, uh, a verse? Hold on, hold on. There's a verse in Proverbs, and it says to build your house in the field. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Who build it? Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. How many of you guys have trouble sleeping? Don't answer that question. How many of you guys wake up in the middle of the night with stress and worry and doubt and fear and panting and... I think I gotta go to the doctor, honey. He said, listen, here's what God wants from you. Let me, re let me reiterate that. Here's what God has for you. When I first decided that I was going to stay married to one woman and there'd be nobody else in my life and that the dedication and the pledge that I made to this woman was going to last, no matter how good the bait from the enemy was, no matter how old the relationship was, no, I am going to be faithful to my wife. Do you know what happened the next day? I slept. I didn't have to worry about who was going to call on the phone emails, text messages. I didn't have to worry. Guys, I'm sorry to, to do this, but I, I didn't have people in my phone named Sam 
Samantha. Oh, that's my boy. That's my boy, Sam. I didn't have to have a secret email address. I didn't have to have locks on my phone. I didn't have to worry when I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning and she was scrolling through my phone because I knew she wasn't finding nothing. Ain't nothing there. Unless the Lord builds a house, you labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches the city, you labor in vain. Because it's vain for you. It's worthless for you to stay up late and to rise early. To try and I was such a liar growing up, I had to write them down because I couldn't remember what BS story I told to what person. Did I tell that person? I don't remember what I told her. And it's the craziest thing. Even though I wasn't a kid anymore, I was already in my late teens, early 20s. Like, I thought everybody else was stupid. Anybody here past their 30s and when a teenager starts to tell them lies and you're like, yeah, hey, I was once your age. I don't fall for stupidity. It was the craziest thing. I, I got a flat on the way to work. Nobody cares. I don't care. Oh, no, but really, truly, here's what happened. So what? I don't care. It's the craziest thing. You know what happens when you dedicate your life to the Lord? You get to sleep. And then right about the time you get used to sleep, the Lord starts waking you up at 4 in the morning. Excuse me, didn't you want to spend time with me so we can pray about things? No, I'm really tired, God. No, you're not. And you're not up because you're stressed anymore. Now you're up because you got work to do. And let me tell you, that's the blessed thing. That's the blessed thing. The Lord woke me up this morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I thought it was the hamburgers. It wasn't. It was my son-in-law and my daughter who have three crazy kids that will not let them sleep more than 35 minutes at a time. They take shifts. One's a newborn. The other one's a year old, and the other one's just three, and they take shifts. Who's going to get up this time? You up at three, you get up at two, I'll get up at 2.45. Hey, son, you might be tired, but you're covered in prayer. It's the best I can do for you right now. <laughs> your wife did that to me and your, and, and, and your mother-in-law. Behold, and here's why I use that whole kid thing. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Did you hear that? It didn't say if you're married. It didn't say if you're... The fruit of the womb is a reward. I don't know who this might be for here. But if you are, have a child out of wedlock, that was no mistake. That was a blessing. Oh, you might have done some dumb things. You might have committed some sins. But God could take even your stupidity and give you a blessing. Do you know how many women in the course of a year I am confronted by who are pregnant and they are in school or they have a career or they're not married and they are absolutely sure that they've just screwed up and they need to go get an abortion? And I say to them, no, 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 listen. The fruit of the womb is a reward. You've been reward rewarded, and I know the look in their face, although they don't say it, rewarded for what? For being a tramp? Rewarded for what? Sleeping with a guy for no reason? What am I being rewarded? You see the look in their face. They feel dirty. They feel used. They know for the rest of their life, people are going to look, oh, you had a kid out of wedlock? You know, they know the judgment of the world is going to fall upon them. No. Jamie, from the day you said you were pregnant, I was so proud of you. I was so proud of you. You, you look beautiful from the day one. And 
motherhood has made you into such an amazing woman and human being and and the testimony goes on because God has rewarded you he's not punished you now it's great if you're married and you planned ahead and you didn't have sex before marriage and you wait praise God hallelujah what a blessing but there is no woman that's ever been pregnant that was cursed by that pregnancy they allowed the enemy to lie to them. And just so you know, in case I'm hurting somebody's feelings here, I've been a part of five abortions in my life. Five. Starting from the time I was 17 years old. And that's just what we did in New York. Man, I knocked my girl up, man. Oh, I heard there's a new place over there I'm picking. Okay, let's go. You know, I find it strange that they put all those abortion clinics in the ghettos in the poor neighborhoods. Why do they do that? That's exactly why they do that. Look up the word eugenics later on and look up the name Margaret Sanger. If you want to know what's really going on with Planned Parenthood, but... Look up Bill Gates' dad because he's the one that funded her. Bill Gates' dad, that's right. He's the one that funded that. But let's save that for another day. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And there is forgiveness for all who have not known that. And there's yet future for all those that will. Do not be ashamed or embarrassed. Rejoice that God has blessed you. Look at this, gentlemen. Like the arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Guys, the world is setting us up. It's telling us, you, you know, what do you mean you're not going to get married? Oh, I, you know, I don't have a house. I don't have a, oh, I see. So you'll choose sin, Christian, over house, over God's faithful provision. Well, I can't have kids now because, because why? Listen, if me and my wife waited till we could afford to have kids, we would have never had kids. But you know what happened? We told God, you keep making us have kids, I guess you're going to have to keep filling up our bank account because these kids eat a lot. <laughs> now some of y'all might think that, that I'm like joking or something. Oh, that's funny. I ain't joking. Me and my wife got six children. Couldn't afford none of them. Not a one. But somehow, none of my kids ever missed a meal. And now we got seven grandchildren, and they ain't missing no meals. Listen, I definitely understand waiting until you want to have kids. That's between you and your wife and the Lord. But if you're waiting because you can't afford it, man, give God a chance. In, in, in um, China right now, the society is so jacked up because if you're not having a boy on your first kid, chances are they're going to abort it. So you have men overpopulating women by like 60% now. It's like almost two to one men or women in China. And they're only allowed by the government in the cities to have one child. Let me tell you what happened in this country all right now i mean to offend no african americans here or whatever you want to call yourself these days but in the 1960s i'm sorry go back even earlier when the slaves were set free the cities of the south started populating the cities of the north and Black people had a marriage rate of over 75% before they had children. And black people were the fastest growing population of wealth on the planet. Forget about the country, the planet. The wealth of black people was the fastest growing population on the planet. 
And then in the 60s, we had a president who came up with this amazing idea called welfare. And he rewarded people for not getting married. And let me tell you what he did. He took people that just got off the plantation and he put them back on the plantation. And now it's not a color thing anymore. Now it's a poor thing. Now it's a class thing, in case you didn't know. Because the exact same thing, if you go to any big city um, ghetto that's white people, especially Virginia, West Virginia, these, these um, Allegheny Mountain people, they're having kids out of wedlock, some 70, 60, 70 percent of kids that are born, born out of wedlock. But when a, when a couple stays together and has kids, four, five, six kids, the kids are like arrows, man. They're, they're your strength and your power. They're your blessing. They're your protection, too. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Some of you guys are like, will you please stop talking about having kids, man? My, 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 my husband wants to have, my wife wants to have kids. Shh. I love kids. I love your kids, I love my kids, I love all kids. My wife calls me the crazy kid person. I act like an idiot every time I see a baby. I love that psalm. Listen to this psalm, 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall, be the man be thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion. And may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Please give me your attention. Let me explain this to you. Let me paraphrase it. Let me make this so clear. Follow God. Find a church. Get married. Stay away from drugs and alcohol. Stay faithful to that woman. And you will be happy. You will be more than happy. You'll be blessed. Don't, and you won't. It's that simple. Like, why in the world are we Katy Perry has 100 million followers on social media. Who? I've never even heard a Katy Perry song. I... How many times has she been married? How many kids out of wedlock? I mean, Cardi B? I, I mean, what are we doing? Okay. Again, Italian thing. Growing up, we worshiped De Niro. De Niro's been married six times. He has kids spread out. Uh, Tom Hanks' has kids in and out of, I mean, I mean whoever your, your rock star of the day is. When me and my wife watch these America's Got Talent shows, and they trot on these kids that are like five, six, seven years old, and they start singing, and, and, they, and everybody, oh my goodness, me and my, I just go, that kid's life's ruined. Ruined, done, over. They just destroy. Well, if you had a kid and, and they're really cute, you should make a model of them. What? Make a model out of them? Why would you want to wreck their lives? Let's bring it a little closer. 
As soon as I see a worship leader that uses the F-E-A-T in their videos, I know it's over. I know it's over. F-E-A-T, featuring. Hillsong worship, featuring. <gasps> Look at her. As soon as they put their name out front, oh, I thought this was supposed to be worship. I thought we were supposed to be directing it that way. No, no, first direct it this way. Then it could go up there. There was another guy who did that too. He didn't last real long. <laughs> he got cast out of heaven. Guys, I'm sorry to tell you this we're just called to be a bunch of nobodies. And I just want to be a rock star to my kids. I just want to be famous to them. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. It's simple. So why is it so hard? I don't know. I don't know what took me so long. Like, can I give you my testimony? I didn't follow God. Had lots of money, lots of women, lots of misery. I followed God, only got one woman, didn't have no money, happier than I've ever been. And now I got lots of women and lots of money. Because God gave me five daughters. <laughs> and a mess of granddaughters and sons. Four boys, three girls, grandkids. I encourage you, you young people here, build your life on the Lord. Don't go back, man. Lastly, in my Bible, this is Johnny's. This is Johnny's, um, Johnny V's psalm. I always think about you in this psalm. I don't know why. Yeah, I do. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. Before you read the last verse too, I had this whole song played out in my head. I, for, I hear this group of people singing, many times have they afflicted me from my youth. Many a time have they afflicted me from my youth. And then I hear the whole rest of the chorus going, but they've not prevailed. I tell you, man, when I'm reading the Psalms, especially the Songs of Ascent, when they were marching all the way, I, I think, how did they do this? Many a time have they, I don't know, many a time. I can't come up with a melody. But they have not prevailed. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. Has the enemy ever plowed over your back and made his furrows long? Dug these deep trenches across your back and you wondered? Have you ever gotten up and said that very famous saying? And the hits just keep coming. When it's so ridiculous, when so much stuff has gone on in your life and it's just like one after another, after another, after another, you just go, and the hits just keep coming. I one time got into two accidents in one day. Yeah. I opened my door. I got into an accident. I hit this guy that was in front of me because I was paying attention to who knows what. And I hit this guy in front of me. I broke my headlight and his taillight. So I told him, listen, don't worry. I'll replace it. Please don't call the insurance. I got no insurance, and I don't even have a driver's license. So I go a couple hours. I get the guy's number. We trade numbers. Back then, there was no cell phones. I was just, and so I was like, I got your number. And I, okay. 
I go to the auto parts store to get the parts, and I'm getting out of my car, and I open my car door, and a guy hits my car door. This is, you just sit back in your car, and, just, and the hits just keep coming. Guess what, though? The Lord is righteous, and he's cut in pieces the cords of the wicked. Let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. Let them be as the grass on the housetop, which withers before it grows up. You guys, let me explain to you what that is. When you live in a place where they build houses out of um, wood, they put mud on there, and the birds come, and they poop out the little seeds, and the grass grows up. But before the grass can grow anywhere, the sun comes down and burns it off. Huh? No root. No, no depth of soil. And he said, that's what I hope happens to them. I hope that the wicked are like the grass which grows on the housetop, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves in his arms. Neither let those who pass by them say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. This last psalm was kind of a, he's saying like, um, I hope nobody ever blesses you. You know why? Because you wrote over my back. You've been mean to me. I hope nobody ever blesses you. As a matter of fact, I hope you die before you grow up. That's what you get. Every once in a while you read a psalm and it's like, yeah, that's kind of harsh. Well, did anyone lie and say they haven't felt like that about their enemies sometime? Not me. I ain't even make believe. Well, that's our study for tonight. <laughs> Close your Bible. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We, um, God, we think about what we just learned. Unless the Lord builds the house, he who sows in tears shall reap in joy. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. God, your word is so rich, it's so powerful, God. It's just too much to, to cover and, and not enough, not enough of my heart to fill it. Thank you, God, for your word. I pray that tonight's word bless those that are here, and that some learned and some found their blessing, God, and some found their promise. Thank you, God, for your word and the testimony of your gospel. Love you and thank you. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.